Mile and dial. Monday! How's up the dogs, right? All right, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Happy Wednesday, everybody. On today's podcast, we're gonna talk about whether or not the higher interest rates mean that you should or should not buy right now. Uh, hint, it depends, I guess. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the best home improvements to increase your value. And finally, we're gonna talk about whether or not it's easier to make friends in Denver or Colorado Springs. We have strong feelings about this. I just wanna note that I resent our neighbor for stringing up holiday lights. She's a 20-something very ambitious redid a house next to us and like has done an amazing job but when you're on your fourth hour of watching 90 day fiance and someone's up doing their christmas lights it's threatening yeah i would say everybody under the age of 30 who is accomplishing a lot more than i ever did by the time i was 40, 40. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite threatening uh, see her house and the work that she's doing through the window where, that, we... <laughs> where we sit on the couch and watch tv <laughs> okay so let's get into this topic uh we actually let's shout out someone that we use that we like a lot her name is becky gonzalez and she is an amazing transaction coordinator so if you are looking for a transaction coordinator uh she's great we use her and this is also where we got this stat which i'm about to read so in 1971, the interest rate for a mortgage was 7.33%. If you waited for interest rates to go down, you wouldn't have purchased a home until 1993. You would have rented for 22 years waiting for rates to go down. Meanwhile, the value of real estate quadrupled. Don't wait to buy real estate. Buy real estate and wait. Marry the house. Date the rate. Do you agree? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I totally do. I totally that that would be a, a real curveball. I mean, I think it speaks to something that we talk about with our clients all the time, which is well, I guess st stepping back a little bit. I get the question all the time: Is this a good time to buy? And I always say yes, unless you think that you will need to sell uh, in two years for some reason. If you look at the real estate market long term over 40, 50, 60 years in Denver and Colorado Springs, and actually across the country. It's just like the stock market. It goes up and down little bits here and there, but uh, zoomed out over the long term, it keeps going up. And so if you plan on buying real estate uh, because you're gonna live there forever or you're gonna live there for a little bit and then turn it into a rental and hold for a long time, um, you should be buying uh, you know, as quickly as you can. Really just keep buying over little by little and that has shown uh, through studies to actually decrease your losses and increase your your wins. There's a super interesting uh, New York Times Daily podcast out this week, I believe, that also talks about this and talks about whether or not it makes sense to rent or buy. There were, I think, they said eleven years was kind of the kind of where it made more sense to buy versus rent. I'm not what sure. What does that mean? Eleven years is where it makes more sense to buy versus rent. That's a good question. They were talking about all the money that you put into a down payment you have to pay about one percent for improvements on a house. So one percent of the cost of the house you're going to annually put toward the house. There's the down payment and then the interest rate. So this guy was kind of interesting. I felt like he was kind of anti buying um, and was saying, you know, in a lot of cases, renting makes more sense. What James and I discussed after that that I thought was interesting was that if, well, if you're encouraging everyone to be a renter, then shouldn't some people buy to be landlords? What he was saying and what James is saying is that if you're going to buy and hold for two years, that's not a very good investment strategy, whether that's the stock market, whether it's your primary residence, whether it's an investment, but if you're going to hold for a little bit longer, 11 plus years, it's a better long-term strategy. Not you should be buying. If you're going to buy, how long do you need to hold? That's kind of what he's getting at, right? And um, I, I think it's still the same as it was three years ago. Now, three or four years ago, you could have bought and then resold in two years and you would have made quite a bit of money, but that's betting on an appreciating market in the short term. Uh, I guess Aaron and I buy betting on appreciation in the long term. That is not to say that it is uh, a buyer's market because it's not. I actually looked at the medium home price year over year. It is steady in Denver in the latest numbers and it's actually 3% up in Colorado Springs. So it's not like these uh, interest rates are turning off enough buyers for prices to go down and there's no indication that there are going to be big price drops. I mean the same su supply and demand issues that we talk about ad nauseum are still the case. Uh, there's just not enough building going on and millennials um, are the biggest cohort since uh, baby boomers and they are at the buying age right now. So 
a lot of people are buying, not a lot of people are selling. With interest rates, prices are, are kind of staying the same. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I think specifically with the daily story, which we'll link to in the notes here, I wonder, even though millennials are the biggest cohort, if they don't have the money to buy, then what, right? Because if you have the biggest generation, but they have no money to buy, that's a problem. And I do also kind of lean toward the fact that I think a lot of people will become long-term renters if they are not tied into their jobs, tied geographically into their jobs, because then they'll have more freedom to travel. So yeah. we'll see how this all, all shapes right. out. It is time for our weekly clickbait story, which is the best home improvements to increase value. <laughs> I actually have really strong feelings about this because... Seven reasons why you replacing <laughs> your roof was a dumb idea. <laughs> I have strong feelings about this because I always feel like garage doors show up as the top item where you can recoup the cost of what you spend versus what you're gonna get back and I have never ever had a buyer say oh I just really love that garage door that garage door makes all the difference now the particular article that we're reading in 2023 is making the case that if you're it brings up curb appeal and that if you have a dumpy looking garage door that is going to turn people off I agree with that but Based off of my research, replacing a garage door on like a 2,500 square foot house costs approximately the same as repainting the entire exterior. And I would make the argument that you'd be better off to repaint the entire exterior, including the garage door, which will make it look fresh. Uh, but I have other thoughts on other things as well. Yeah, I, I think the garage door is kind of like uh, the front door replacement, which is number three on Zillow's list here as well. Um, I'm not sure anyone is like, I want to buy this house because the front door is pink or purple or red or whatever the kind of fun, new, fresh color is. Um, but I do think that it's a barrier to get past to even consider the home. It's the first, it's the first impression, right? And I think garage door is kind of like that. Um, but based on that logic, then the yard and stuff should be part I, of this, right? I agree. They don't even talk about the yard, do they? I don't think so. I, I, I just don't, I do not understand this because this isn't the first time that the garage door has shown up as the number one item. And I'm like, who is writing this article? Is it a garage door manufacturer? Like that, <laughs> this is ridiculous. I just have never heard anyone discuss the garage door with me. First where they notice that the garage door looks like crap. Um, it, it's like bent at the bottom or something like that. And so I don't, yeah, I agree. I don't think that you should be spending a ton of money on your garage door, but you better make sure that just like the front door should, should work immediately, look good because but it this, is the first impression. This is why I'm pushing for exterior paint is because it's a way to freshen up the entire exterior of the house and even a junky garage door you can make look a lot nicer with paint. With paint. All right, right let's go right. to the second one which is stone veneer. So stone veneer and vinyl siding are pretty close to one another. I feel like stone veneer has a similar issue to backsplashes which is that you have to be careful with it because it can bring up a space really quickly. It can also look outdated super fast. So I'm not sure how I feel about the stone veneer. I actually feel like vinyl siding has a longer shelf life, but I don't have any data to back that uh, we up. Are not. Once again, it's just something that I do hear. Uh, I, so I just had these young buyers who were looking up in North Clan and like all the homes look basically the same, but every once in a while we'll go into a neighborhood that has done the stone veneer and they all say, oh, I love the, I love the way this looks. They don't say stone veneer. They're, they don't even have, you know, no one has that terminology at the top of their head except for realtors, but they look at the outside of that house and say, I like that. They think it makes it look a little more expensive. It, I yeah, mean, exactly. like it makes it look like a little bit higher end property. It's a chateau. It's not just a home. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just worry that again, it could look dated yeah. very quickly. No, I, I think that in general, trying to stay classic as opposed to trendy yes, exactly. is the way to go. The problem is, I, do people know? I mean, not everybody has taste. So, so do you know what classic is versus trendy? I think a lot of people do. A lot of people, even if they couldn't define classic, no classic when they see it. Yeah. So the next item is kitchen remodel. I agree with this. I think I think the kitchen and the living room are the most important spaces in the entire house. I'm not sure though the buyers always think that. So I think one thing that I like to point out to my clients, my buying clients, um, is that if a place is opened up, because people are spending so much time in the kitchen, it's a good place for mothers or fathers to 
prep or get their day ready, but also be able to watch their kids if the kids are in the living room playing or watching TV. But if you're gonna do something like that, you need to advertise it. You need to bring it to their attention because it's not always gonna be front of mind. So I think the kitchen is extremely important, but the things that you put in, you wanna highlight. And again, you need to think about who the end buyer is or who's probably gonna be there. So if it's a really strong school district, then probably the people that move in are gonna have kids. So you wanna talk about that opening up of the kitchen. Maybe you also wanna talk about it having a brand new dishwasher because that's a convenience that will save people a lot of time. Anything else like that, a mud room where it's like they can take off all their shoes here. I know some of this stuff seems obvious, but marketing just goes so far and there's so many missed opportunities. Here. I just feel like anything that's a money saver or an environmental issue is going to become more important going forward. We're already seeing this with solar panels, but obviously I think windows are have been a big issue and will continue to be a big issue. And I say this from our house where Monday through Friday we have committed to only heating it to 60 degrees and have bought all of these heated pads to sit on uh, because our house was built in 1890 and the windows are not that old, but they're quite old and they don't hold uh they don't hold heat well yeah <laughs> that's we should do a whole segment on our <laughs> on our attempts to save money by <laughs> freezing out ourselves um, <laughs> yeah i i don't even know if people think about it as an environmental issue i think they do think about it as a money issue for sure um and more to that it's just like a gut thing it's one of the things one of the big things they see when they they move in and i when i walk through showings all the time with buyers, uh, they always comment on the windows. Uh, they're either old windows or they're newer windows. They open or they don't. I mean, interestingly enough, we acquired our primary residence because someone else had been under contract on the place before us and she wanted all of the windows replaced and the seller would not do it. This was September of 2020, so it was a hot market and we agreed to take the property without the window replacements. I still think that that was in our favor. I'm still glad we did that, but I guess that proves the point that to some people it is extremely important. Uh, roof replacement, I think this is pretty standard. Uh, I think there's often a good insurance claim with it, or if there isn't, you don't get the roof replaced. But I think if you do an inspection on the property ahead of time and the inspector says the roof needs to be replaced, believe me as the seller this will come up when a buyer is looking at your place because that's one of the top items the inspector is going to look at going to look for yeah hopefully you've had a hail damage in the <laughs> recent past because it happens all the time here in colorado so um if you do have it this is just something to note if you have uh, if you're in an area where there's a big hail storm you should look into your insurance because you it, it's one of the easier ways to get a new roof uh here in colorado same thing with a windstorm. If you've had a big windstorm, yeah. sometimes that can take off a Blow lot of shingles. shingles but in this market, which is softening just a bit, it's becoming slightly more of a buyer's market than it was in the past. I think one of the bigger issues is just, can you sell your property? Um, and it, what, not whether or not you're either gonna get the money back, but are you gonna sell it at all? And I think you kind of need to stand out now more than you did say five years ago when you could just throw your house on and it would sell in a day. Um, so you need to have some updates and you need to think about it at least thoughtfully. Maybe you don't have to redo your kitchen, but you do have to think about what your place looks like and be objective and listen to your agent uh, when they tell you that this is not going to sell. Or if you don't want to do anything, then you need to sell it at a discounted price. You need to sell it as a value home because that's what it is. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's a lot of missed opportunities for marketing here. And so those are things that you can do. I'm, people get very hung up on open houses and I totally get that. But if you want to push your agent on something, I would not push them on an open house. I think the benefit of an open house a lot of times is for the agent to pick up new clients. I think very rarely does it actually become a sale for the seller. But what you should be pushing your agent on is who, who do you think the end buyer is going to be and what do they care about and are we highlighting I'm a huge Reddit nerd and there was a thread in there about unfriendly cities. I guess I was both surprised and unsurprised that Denver had the most votes of any city for being unpopular. Of the different comments, the only other comment that had more upvotes than Denver being a very rude city was a comment that said, as a New Yorker, I'm really relieved that New York City isn't on this list. <laughs> so I found that to be interesting and we definitely have thoughts on that. I don't, 
I don't actually remember thinking that Denver was a rude city. And in fact, I do distinctly remember moving from the Midwest where everyone is, uh, I don't want to say fake friendly, but they are more bubbly friendly, more overtly, you know, higher pitched voice when they're saying thank you. And like, they just sound more Southern uh, when they are being friendly. But I remember moving to Denver and thinking these people feel to me I don't mean to stereotype, more genuinely friendly um, when I was interacting. Now, I don't know if that has shifted. We've lived, we had lived in Denver long enough for a lot of things to change, and I don't know if that has changed, but I, I never found Denver to be rude. That is definitely a comment in uh, the discussion about Denver being rude, is that it has just changed rapidly in the last 10 years. So people's feelings about it might be very different. There were also some interesting takes on the fact that New Yorkers are kind, but they're not nice. So they may not smile at you, but they might like you. And Californians are nice, but they're not kind. So they'll smile at you, but not like you. And also the idea that Denver is what a lot of people think the stereotype is about LA, which, the, which is that there's a lot of snobbery there. I hate to say it, but I kind of agree with the Reddit thread. I mean, I am like a Denver stan. Every time we go there, I love it. I think when we decided to move to Colorado Springs, people were absolutely shocked, but I have had a far easier time making friends and quality friendships in Colorado Springs over Denver, which was very surprising to me given the demographic differences. But I also would say I have a couple of friends here that moved down from Denver and they seem to feel the same way. And so make friends and I am happier with our social group in Colorado Springs. I realize that's anecdotal. It's just one example, but that is my first person experience. Yeah. First hand, first person. I guess you could, it could be first hand, but third person. Which is someone you, else's hand? Is, no, Aaron. Aaron enjoys Colorado Springs. Says Aaron. Th that would be third person, but first experience or something. It is a dream of mine to start <laughs> referring to myself in the third person at all times. I think I've got two theories on why we've done really well. I know you just said you felt that way about Colorado Springs. I feel the exact same way. I think we have made just a lot more friends, volume wise, and and uh, closer wise. We're actually, you know. Uh, have deeper friendships, I think, here. I also think there is a forcing function that comes with being kind of the minority in a city. We are left of center on the political spectrum, and we moved into an area very much like that in Colorado Springs, but Colorado Springs as a whole is more conservative, and I think there's something about being the small group that kind of sticks together, whereas in Denver, it's like going on Tinder or Bumble or something uh, where there's just a, an abundance of choices and so you never end up wanting to get close to anyone. Yes, I have also heard that Meetup does far better in Colorado Springs than in Denver. So I've just heard the success rate in Colorado Springs, like people are more involved and they participate more in it. So I find that kind of interesting. What do you Meet up. It also might just be how things have changed since COVID because we've pretty much lived here. We moved here a couple of months before COVID. So perhaps things have changed since that. Yeah, so that's interesting because I think um, the dog park, this impromptu dog park that we go to where we met a lot of the friends that we now have uh, in Colorado Springs, um, there were a lot of people there. I think we assumed, or I assumed, that uh, it had always been the case that these people went there. But uh, now whenever I talk to this one person who's kind of the hub for all of our friends, um, she said, no, they had just started going to that dog park. A lot of the people just started going to this, this big open field and creating something during COVID. So maybe that is part of it. You know, I've been really interested in the work from home movement, not just as a real estate trend, but also what this means for the larger social demographics. And so in my mind, that means anything that creates community is going to have a lot of value in the future because you're not getting community from work. And similarly to that, a lot of the American population is actually getting less religious as well. And I think a lot of people went to church for the community or in part went for community. And so I think opportunities to find other people that you see on a regular basis and can develop friendships are important. And so Meetup maybe facilitates that. But I think even in this discussion, we considered whether or not we should talk about this topic because we are pro Denver and obviously we service Denver, but I think it's a really important point. I think there's a lot of people that are lonely that are looking for friendship. And if one city lends itself more to making friends and to having a group that you can socialize with, that's 
that's a very important criteria in what you're looking for. Oh, that's it, hard to filter for. Absolutely. And I, I guess on an end note, I will say this, and it kills me to say this, but I think almost everyone I know that has moved Colorado Springs from Denver is happier in Colorado Springs.